Um, I'm really excited uh, to introduce the next two speakers. Uh, they're the co-authors of a new book called The Network Nonprofit, uh, which is what they're going to be talking about. Um, one of these two speakers, Allison Fine, is a very good friend of, of mine personally and of, of PDF. We published a book together two years ago called Rebooting America, uh, which Allison did all the heavy lifting uh, work on. Um, and she's produced an even better book here with her collaborator, Beth Cantor. Beth, I, I just have to say, uh, who I've, uh, we've bumped into each other at other conferences. Uh, we've never had Beth before on stage here at PDF. She's been voted the, the, the best keynoter at all kinds of conferences. We're really thrilled to have her here today. The two of them are going to do something highly interactive. So come on up, and the stage is yours. Beth Cantor and Allison Fine. Good morning. Uh, I am Allison Fine, and I and she's got the clicker. She always has the power. And she has the power. <laughs> this is a, a partnership. Uh, I'm delighted great. to be Thank with you. you here this morning. I have had the great privilege of having a front row seat for the last six or seven years uh, to watch and record this revolution in the use of social media for social change. I do that from several platforms as a senior fellow at a think tank here in New York called Demos, a wonderful place, uh, and with Beth at uh, a firm called Zoetica. But I'm particularly pleased to be here at PDF this morning because I've always considered PDF to be my home base uh, and am, have been enormously grateful to Micha and to Andrew for their constant mentoring and teaching, at times Micha nudging, uh, over these several years. So thank you very much for having us. Great. Thank you, Allison. And I'd like to echo Allison's word of thanks to Mika and to Andrew. And I'm so glad to be here in real-time voice, face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. instead of vicariously participating through your Twitter stream or online streaming. So I'm, I'm psyched. I'm, I'm, I'm honored. Um, let's see if I can do the mic and the clicker at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> one, for, one for each hand. Um, so I'm the uh, visiting scholar, or Scholar 2.0, at the Lucille and David Packard Foundation. And as you can see, I wear many hats, including that red one. I am also the CEO of Zoetica. And I've been writing a blog for the last almost 10 years now on how nonprofits can embrace social media. And I've had the pleasure of working with Allison on this book for the last year. And on the, on the topic of, uh, of this talk, how, how do you rethink nonprofits in an age of connectivity? And so rather than talk about the book <laughs> for the next uh, 20 minutes, we've picked up one provocative theme that we'd like to share with you. And then we'd like to open it up for conversation and uh, your thoughts and hear your stories. But first, we want to tell you why we wrote this book. So there's a problem. And so we set out to articulate the problem, and then identify a solution to it. The problem is that Beth and I, like many of you, have spent our careers in the nonprofit sector. And during that time, we've all seen the size of the sector explode. The number of nonprofit organizations, the number of foundations, the number of staff, the number of donations has all exploded geometrically. However, in that same time period, on any measure of social change, the needle hasn't moved. Take any major issue area. Take public education, public health, public welfare and well-being. The needle hasn't moved. Take fundraising. Uh, donations as a percentage of the GMP has not increased in the last 20 years. So something isn't working. And that something is that complex social problems, and all social problems are complex by definition, outstrip the capacity of any single organization or individual to solve them. So then what's the solution? The solution is moving from a focus on growing individual nonprofit organizations, which is where we have been, to growing networks. Networks of individuals and organizations open up an enormous capacity of uh, goodwill, creativity, uh, people 
to solve problems. But the most important part about networks for social change is that they scale very quickly and very inexpensively, just the opposite of growing individual organizations. And so this means that we will have a much better chance of solving social problems through networks. Great, <laughs> she's gonna hold the mic for me. <laughs> so um, let's take this down a few pegs and take a look at what it looks like on the street. So here's what nonprofits look like now. Okay, so we have the staff in their silos, in their cubicles, not talking to one another, not working together. Um, behind the institutional logo, the firewall, working singularly to try to solve a really complex social problem. And where do we want them to change? What do we want this to look like? We want it to look a little bit like this. So what do we have? We have behind the firewall, matrix of teams working, cross departments. The institution becomes a little bit more see-through, a little bit more transparent. Um, the firewall maybe gets moved a few inches. Maybe it even disappears. And then outside, there are networks, networks of people and organizations working together to solve these complex problems. But going from this to that, it's not as easy as uh, changing a light bulb, flipping a switch. It, it's a hard process for some organizations. And in the book, we lay out a 12-step process. And um, Allison's going to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> I get the addiction part. So look, we have some really good news to share. And that is, had we been talking about this three, four, five years ago, the only organizations we could have shared with you that were network nonprofits would have been those that were born this century. Something very exciting has happened over the last two years or so, which is traditional organizations are transforming themselves, turning themselves inside out into network nonprofits. And when we looked at the newer organizations and when we looked at the transforming organizations, we found that there was a framework of how they were working and operating that made them effective. We had to get beyond the pinging and the poking and the buzzing to really figure out what the fundamental parts, components of these organizations are. And as you can see, it goes uh, left to right <laughs> from a way of being that enables a way of doing. You know when an organization is doing without being, when you hear them say, we tried that Facebook stuff and it didn't work for us, right? They just jumped into doing and they didn't jump into being. So what we want to do today is we want to pull out two of these concepts to talk about uh, why they're so important. One is free agents and one is fortresses. So Beth, why don't you tell us about free agents? Sure. That's a free agent. He has the t-shirt to prove it. And out of all the audiences I speak to, I don't think I need to define free agents for this crowd because uh, PDF really celebrates and embraces free agents. But just for the record, <laughs> a free agent, for the 0,00,0,0,0,0,9% of you who don't know what the term free agent means, um, a free agent is a person, maybe a young person, maybe an older person like me, who is really passionate about social change and fluent in social media and is able to do the organizing, the online fundraising, the awareness raising that traditionally has been done by nonprofits, but they're doing it out outside of those institutional formalities. So just because I have a wired bunch here who are on Twitter, um, I like to do a really quick census of free agents. If you could just tweet the name, if you're a free agent, um, if you could tweet with the hashtag free agent and NetNon, and then maybe identify anyone uh, that's in your network who you know is a free agent, we'd like to know about them. So to, um, I'm sure you can tweet while you're listening, and Allison can uh, explain fortresses. So fortresses, I used to ask people, who thinks they work for a fortress organization, but nobody would raise their hand. So now we just define it. So uh, you know what fortresses are. They're uh, buildings that have high walls and wide moats. The purpose of an organizational fortress is to keep the inside people in and the outside people out. And they do that through a mantra of control and fear of losing that control. They do way more talking than listening. Creative. They strategize and dictate at their communities. And ultimately, they end up locked up inside 
as standalone organizations viewing the world through a lens of what Andrew will call scarcity, where uh, almost every meeting has beneath it the cry that we don't have enough time, people, or resources. That's how fortresses work. And, you know, one of the reasons that we wrote this book is because we looked out into the landscape and we saw free agents crashing into the fortresses. And <laughs> there's the free agent, and there's the fortress, many times not even denting the, the firewall. Sometimes they make it through, sometimes they don't. So we wondered, you know, what needs to change you know, about fortresses to stop this collision? Yeah. So fortresses can change, which is the very good news. And uh, what they become is they become, you know, the, the general metaphor is, is always a glass house. But uh, in our view, that leaves walls up, and we don't want the walls up. So now we talk about uh, organizations that are changing as sponges. They're anchored to the ocean floor, they have a, so they have a purpose. And natural sponges let 20,000 times their weight of water flow through. They grab the good stuff and let go of the other stuff. That's how we want organizations to work. When they work that way, uh, they end up being transparent organizations. Social media is, has an enormous effect on these organizations. They are pulling them outwards. They are engaging with their communities like sunlight, like moms <laughs> rising, like charity water. They are taking advantage of all of that capacity uh, out there and creativity. And they view the outside world as agents of change, not as competition and not as sources uh, that drain them. You know, so this has left us with this aching, unanswered question that we're dying to talk to you about. How many free agents <laughs> does it take <laughs> to turn a fortress inside out? Mm. So, come on, we, 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 we had so much fun with um, light bulb jokes and free agents and, and fortresses. I'm sure we can come up with a few. Um, so let me tell you about um, a real story that happened to us when we actually saw one of these collisions happen. Uh, in fact, last month. So meet Sean. Um, some of you may know of his work, Uncultured. And I think he's a poster child for being a free agent. He's, um, he's 29, he dropped out of graduate school a couple years ago because he, he has this overwhelming desire to, to stop extreme global poverty and thinks that his generation is the one um, to solve it. But he knows that doing um, uh, work on the ground in places like Bangladesh, you know, helping widows, helping malaria survivors, you know, he can't do it alone. So what he's done is uh, t taken to uh, social networks. He's very fluent in using um, tools like Twitter, YouTube, and he shares his story with um, his network. And he's basically created a, a movement of people who care about this issue that are in the palm of his hand or in the uh, viewer of his flip camera. And, um, and so, um, and he does this in a way that's different than traditional nonprofit institutions. So we witnessed a collision uh, last month at the N10 NTC conference. And um, Sean's frustration with um, traditional organizations really filled the room. So he came up and he grabbed the mic and he spoke to a room full of nonprofits. And I'm gonna have to read it. The problem isn't social media. The problem is you, you are the fortress. You know, I have a quarter of a million followers on Twitter. I have a million, two million views on YouTube. It's not me, you're the problem. You're not taking me seriously. Mm. And then he stood up and you can't really see it here. And he pointed a finger that one, <laughs> oh, a, a nice one, uh, to Wendy Harmon from the Red Cross. And he said, you know, when the Haiti earthquake struck, I wanted to connect my network with your organization and mobilize them to help. But you just dismiss me as some guy on YouTube. Mm. <laughs> Crashing. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Beth, okay. I searched an hour for that sound effect. Beth likes to get. Better laugh. <laughs> she gets her money's worth out of her sound effects, right? Right, and it works, so I didn't have to replicate that here on stage. Um, so the story doesn't end here. 
okay? So a month afterwards, um, uh, throughout the month, Wendy had engaged with him on his blog. They had several email exchanges, and she invited him to a meeting at Red Cross headquarters just uh, and explore how they could work together, and now he has called the Red Cross the Unfortress. Mm. Which is one step <laughs> in a long progression of small steps to change traditional nonprofits. Right, so we're at the beginning of this journey. You know, we wrote a book, but it's certainly not the end of the story. We're at the beginning of the beginning on this. Uh, this kind of change is going to take courageous and humble leadership on the part of organizations. In your bags, uh, there's a flyer that has a URL for the chapter on social culture in our book, which is critical to this kind of transition. But we really wanted to have a conversation uh, with you today. So we thought we would pose two questions that we've been wrestling with, which we would like to learn from you uh, about what you think about these questions. So there, uh, what has been your experience in turning fortresses inside out? And should we, should we try to change free agents or just let them be? Hmm. So you can Great come question. To, come to the mics on the side and uh, let us know what you think. We'll wait, or we'll play the sound effects again. You know, no. <laughs> you know, we should tell you that we've worked together for about five years now, uh -huh. written several papers and a book together. This is our third time in a room together. And we find it amazing that we look so good together. Don't we look terrific, <laughs> right? <laughs> Hi there. Hi. Is this on? I don't know if it is. There we go. Um, Michael Dick here. I was in that room. So um, the, the observation that just came to me is, in fact, Wendy and Sean were sort of co-conspirators in the sense that she was looking for someone who was on the outside to sort of push the organization because I think and clearly she's wanting to move her organization. So I guess the question would be for free agents encountering organizations that don't have the inside mole, so to speak. Like how do they get in if they don't have a Wendy Harmon? Is that exactly. The question? Yeah. So look, I'll start and you can uh, finish it. The Red Cross is a remarkable story right now. If you had looked at the Red Cross right after Katrina and then compared it uh, in January to Haiti, it is in many ways a very different organization, much more open uh, to the world and listening. And that's because of uh, you know Wendy's uh, efforts in that regard. Um, so, you know, Free agents, I think, are going to have to knock on many doors for organizations. I think the problem becomes uh, a very quick frustration with uh, getting turned away uh, immediately. And this is a recognition that not all organizations are where the Red Cross is right now. Yeah, and I remember, I don't know if you remember in the room when Sean got up and he said, I have two million views on YouTube. Five other people handed them his, their cards. So not, there's not, not every single nonprofit is a, a fortress. And I think that if you're, if nonprofits that have a social media presence need to be listening to people like Sean. In fact, he wrote a blog post this morning about you know, how to help free agents and what he needs. <laughs> He's advocating for this. And, um, and, and it comes like down to listening and building relationships and, and taking them seriously. Respect. That would be me. Hi, I'm Tracy Mann. I work with South by Southwest, and I also work with a kind of a guerrilla NGO called Climate Wise Women. I've had some very bad experiences trying to turn out the fortress, and I'd love to hear your comments on what you do with um, large NGOs who feel that they own an issue and nobody else gets into that space. Could you right. comment on that? Right. So this is, this is just exactly uh, the issue of fortresses feeling like they have proprietary control over issues and people and messages. So what's happening is they're losing, um, if they ever had large market share, they're losing it. There is a crisis for large nonprofit organizations now, particularly those that were created last century uh, and have been living off of their donor bases those direct mail donor bases for a very long time. You know, there's even speculation that many of them will go under uh, in the next couple of years. So what's going to happen is they're either going to change or they're going to go under. Um, but we are seeing a willingness, uh, a number uh, of them, uh, for instance, Common Cause, a group we're working with now, uh, that understand that they have to change. The change may not come as quickly as those of us on the outside want, but the change is happening. Yeah, I think it takes a lot of patience. 
um, having talked to a lot of people working in fortresses. And, and that very first step is really important, is not, is the kind of don't let the skepticism um, quiet you or scare you, and, and actually to embrace it and honor, honor it and celebrate it, because um, don't let it stop at the skepticism, because that opens up the first conversation. And then being able to ask, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Can we try a small, a small pilot and see what happens? Thank you. But you know, one of the things that we see is when social media and networking is left to the summer intern down the hall, uh, you can get something started, but you can't sustain it organizationally. That kind of s s you know uh, capacity over time only comes from the commitment of organizational leaders. Jed, uh, that's exactly what I wanted to ask about. Oh my, darn! My name is Jed. Uh, I've worked at a couple of large organizations and have tried to be like, like you guys are um, an, ev an evangel realist, I call it. But um, when you, my question is, what do you do after you leave? What is an, you know, people come in, you know, let's say you have a good sponsor who comes in, who invites you in, and you get some momentum going at an organization on a project or on a concept on what it means to both be and do in the right balance. And then you or the consultant that they paid more than you, um, who took them for a lot of money and left, what do you do when you leave? Okay, fine. Right. See, I, I think that um, it, uh, the social media can't be built on the shoulders of one person and that you need to have, it needs to be everywhere within the organization. And you need to start little by little. You have to think of yourself um, internally while you're there before you get frustrated and leave um, as a network builder from within. That's exactly right. And, um, and start um, bringing the fire to people in little small <laughs> amounts so they don't get burned. Getting them excited. You have to be the cheerleader. Um, and then so you have to build it so that it's still spinning. It's still there when you do leave. You know, we like to say that social media is not a spectator sport, it's a contact sport. We need everybody on board. This isn't a, a social media department. It isn't one area that has this function. This has to be whole organizational capacity. But sometimes it's only a consultant who's really bringing this, you know, religion. That's a mistake. It's a mistake for an organization to hire a consultant to do that. Right, and that consultant ought to be building organizational capacity, not just coming with expertise and leaving. Hey, uh, my name is Decker Gongang with Mobilize.org. Um, I can't hear you. Decker Gongang with Mobilize.org. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> um, my question, well, not necessarily a question, um, but one of the fortresses that, that we see is as we address education um, and the, the graduation completion crisis that our country is facing, um, there's many organizations working to save our kids, um, but they've all got their own strategy. Um, so there's kind of a need for figuring out not necessarily what works, but what we're all doing. Um, and then secondly, um, a lot of us aren't talking to the students, uh, talking to the young people. Um, Myself, being a young African-American male, I find myself the only one at conferences or discussions about these issues. So how can we create solution apprenticeships um, and then include those in our strategies? Um, because they're not necessarily about Twitter, but it's how do you have those face-to-face -face conversations within your organization with the people that you're trying to help? Okay, I'm going to take the first part of your question, which was how do you work with other organizations who are using social media to kind of get on the same page around strategy? And I think it's a, a group of environmental organizations. All the social media people um, do this loose collaboration. I mean, they have a listserv, I know, old fashioned. Um, and they have a couple of people who are making sure that the right people are in that listserv, and they have agreed to a cultural norm of this listserv is really just to share a tweet and get other people to retweet or to share one sentence about a blog post we've written about an issue and, and share it. And, they and then they have maybe a, f a phone call every other week. And so they're trying to do this in a very simple, uh, light way um, uh, to, to coordinate. And that's one way to get started that can be easy. One of the things uh, that we have to educate organizations about, DEC, is the idea that working at, in networked ways is different than the old organizational collaborations that were very formal contractual relationships. Uh, when you're working in network ways, when the walls come down and inside and outside is blurred, then by uh, almost instinct, 
you would be including students in those conversations. They have to be included in those conversations, and they're facile on social media, so why wouldn't they be? So that kind of attitude and culture change happens once you begin to think like uh, networked uh, people and organizations. Having been one of the young summer interns who gets put in charge of a Facebook page okay. because I'm the only one with a Facebook. Let's give this guy a hand. Let's give this guy a hand. <laughs> what would you recommend for someone in my position or a similar position to change the organization? Yeah. So not so easy for a summer intern to do, so, but thanks for asking <laughs> <laughs> the question. <laughs> right? So one thing is you want to hand our book or a book like it to the CEO, right? You've got to say uh, this really has to have your attention on this. One of the things that we love seeing, and we're starting to see a, a little trend in this, are um, folks in leadership positions in organizations or on boards availing themselves of the capacity, the creativity, the know-how of younger people and uh, engaging them as reverse mentors to come in and teach them about social media. We were talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago who said, how do we get mentors for our young uh, interns? And we said, think about it the other way. Those interns should be mentors. Uh, but it requires the leadership to take this very seriously, put it on their calendar, you know, that they're going to have you for two hours a week show them Twitter and practice uh, using it. That, for the organization, would be a much better use of your time in helping to build the organization's capacity than throwing up the Facebook page that they're going to ignore once you're gone. <laughs> right, it's sort of a new definition of um, social media interns, sort of as a peer trainer, as a coach, um, rather than um, you know, teaching them to fish, or at least teaching them to put their hand in the water and know that it's not that cold, it's okay. <laughs> um, and also, I think on the other side about this time, I, I, I've actually facilitated meetings between interns and communications teams, is this sort of, the, the tendency is just to throw the, in, you know, shovel it over to the intern, yeah. let the intern take care of it, and not to have any communication around what is it that the intern's doing. So you also have to make sure that what you're doing is integrated with whatever communications plan um, is there, and that takes, you know, maybe a 15-minute meeting once a week. <laughs> you know, ask for a couple, you know, a 15-minute meeting. Hi, I'm Roz Lemire with Vision Strategy. Um, I thought your opening slide was, uh, or opening was fascinating and a little bit depressing about the exponential growth of um, organizations and flat social indicators. Um, do you, what brings you to the conclusion that better networked and open organizations fixes that problem? And do you have some examples maybe of that type of, you know, more networked organization uh, or networks of organizations being more effective solving social problems? And their difference, I'm sorry, let me respond. Yes, when you look at uh, an organization like, say, the Red Cross that has become more networked, the capacity they were able to tap right after the earthquake in Haiti, right, the capacity of people on the ground, groups on the ground, individuals on the ground, was capacity they could have never tapped after Katrina. They, in fact, ignored it after Katrina. So that's a way of saying, you know, that's one great example, I think, of being able to uh, see this network as a source of abundant capacity for an organization that can scale immediately uh, in an issue like that. You know, I was also thinking about um, TechSoup Global. I don't know if you're familiar with TechSoup Global, but there are an incredible network of affiliates all around the world where uh, they're distributing um, Microsoft and other products, as well as capacity building services and, and training. And what was interesting, I th obviously they didn't have a uh, partner on the ground in Haiti, but in Chile they did. And so once the earthquake struck there, their partner was able to um, uh, create a mobile telecenter so people could um, contact their relatives. And within their network um, of other organizations and people, they were supporting it, they were sending equipment, they were um, sending funds. So it's kind of paying attention to building up those relationships, and it comes down to people. <laughs> it, we say it, it's making relationships and um, working with one another. Alison, Beth, thank you very much. Great.